right oh here we go so you can hi everybody who's joining Right, we're just going to wait a couple more minutes for anyone else who wants to join to join us and then we will kick off. Nice, loads of people. Right, so um, welcome everybody. Um, going to give it one more minute because we're just until one minute past and then we're going to start. Um, for those of you that want captions you can enable them in the bottom of the toolbar but i'll come back to that in a moment okay right i think we are good to go um, so welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm really um, grateful to all of you for your interest in doing so. My name's Josie. I'm going to do a full introduction shortly, but just a few housekeeping before we begin. Um, as I mentioned, for those of you that want to access captions at the bottom of the screen, just please click on the show captions on the bottom menu bar and you'll see it there. Um, for everybody else, um, for all of you, in fact, we are recording the session and so if you don't want to take notes that's fine we're going to send you the recording afterwards so you can access it then and we'll also list it on the advert of the website um, for anybody else that wants to um, refer back to it. Uh, we've had lots and lots of questions in advance and so thank you very much for doing that. We have because there's a fair bit of duplication, we've kind of consolidated questions into themes and hopefully we will um, do our best to address absolutely everything that was covered. Um, we think we've captured everything, but you can also additionally ask questions via the Q&A button at the bottom of the uh, screen, which you'll see below. Um, not, I know that we, I put on the web, web advert that if you want to see a full information pack, we've created a big document, um, which I can send over to you by email, just email me separately to josie at creativeaccess.org.uk. And that's got a much fuller job description than the one on the web page. I'm going to recap the timings at the end, but just to let you all know the process of the application, and then we'll go on to the main session. Um, we're working to a pretty tight schedule. We Our deadline for applications is next week, the 17th at midday, and then we're going to be doing first round calls with myself on the Friday the 19th, Monday the 22nd, and Tuesday 23rd. Um, and then we will view, do first round panel interviews with three people, which is our chair, Amit Shah, one of our other board members, Cameron, and myself. They'll be taking place on Monday the 29th of April and Friday the 3rd of May. So we really hope people will be available on either one of those. And then we're going to move to final interviews towards the 13th, um, around the week of the 13th of May. And you'll get a chance to meet members of the Creative Access team there as well. We're ideally hoping that the successful candidate will be able to start in the autumn as, as, as far as possible, though we are obviously flexible on that too. So I'm going to recap that at the end. Um, but just to say one more time, thank you all very much for joining us today. We are... Um, excited to have had such great interest in the role and we're really hoping to find um, someone brilliant to join our team. Um, as I said, my name is Josie Dobrin. I'm one of the founders of Creative Access. Um, my background's in communications. I used to work for lots of different um, charities and I work for um, a director of a corporate PR firm and also for the Mayor of London, the first Mayor of London, Ken Livingstone. Um, I'm really, really excited to be joined here by Lizzie. We were just talking about how this is a full circle moment for her. But Lizzie, I'm going to pass over to you because Lizzie is going to be kind of asking the questions today and running the show. So over to you. Yeah, I'm also going to just say that Josie's just been awarded an OBE for her work at Creative Access, which is surely an inspiration to anyone who's looking to fill the CEO role. Uh, but yeah, as you say, Josie, I'm an alumna of Creative Access. I did an internship at The Times in 2017. I've maintained my relationship with Creative Access ever since, um, mentoring and um, going through masterclasses. And then I joined the steering group last year and I'm now a non-executive director on the board. So um, you'll deal with me if you are the next CEO and I've got a vested interest in picking a winner. Um, so Josie, if we get cracking, can you just tell everyone why Creative Access is special and what we do differently to our rivals in the space? Um, so yeah, good question. I mean, I think 
one of the well, first of all, we all, we were one of the first. We we're one of the originals, which sounds like a funny thing to say, but as we know, the diversity and inclusion space has changed hugely over the last kind of ten years or so. And at 13, 14 years old, we were definitely one of the first. To, to, to address the issues here. I think what's particularly significant about us is that we're a social enterprise, we're not-for-profit. We are what we call impact-driven. And so we really maintain the injury led by the, our community, for our community. And when we talk about our community, we're talking about people who are underrepresented across the creative industries through disability, through, social, through socioeconomic status, through racial minoritization and other characteristics too. The thing that, the other thing that makes us very special is that we are cross sector and cross characteristic. And by that, I mean, we're not, although we work across the whole creative economy, so not just, you know, the wider creative industries, but also creative functions within non-creative organizations. For example, you might've seen that we're working with Chelsea Football Club or McLaren Racing or Greenpeace and, and we're working with their creative teams there. So we cross sector, we don't just work in theatre or TV or advertising, we work across them all, for example, and we work across cross, we're across career stage as well. So we work with people at entry level right through to boards. Um, and then the other thing that I would say is that it's cross characteristic. So we're not just, you know, we're focusing on anyone from any underrepresented background. So what we'll find with our competitors or people that work in, a, in the spaces, they're much more kind of niche, whereas with us, we can take a kind of wider view of, um, across the creative economy. And what are the biggest challenges that creative access faces at the moment? Because we've been going for over 10 years. What would success look like over the next three, five, 10 years? And where do you see growth coming from? Um, lots of big questions there. I mean, I think just taking your first question about the biggest challenges, I think I just alluded to so one of them, of course, is the competition, you know, making sure that we're staying fresh and staying relevant and that we are um, demonstrating best practices of all times as a team and staying one step ahead of what's um, the conversation and the narrative out and what, what both our employer partners and our, the individuals within our communities want. Um, so I think that's a significant challenge. I think another big challenge for us is around technology. And I would say that's something that we've embrace less possibly than other organizations so there's a real opportunity there for example um how is ai going to impact us i know it's a conversation that most of us in the creative industries are talking about but at creative access we haven't done a huge amount to embrace it yet so there's a real opportunity there to think about um the digitalization digitalization of some of our services and thinking about whether there's, there's an opportunity there i think the other challenge for us is really around the economy and kind of well, there's a twofold thing. One is the sort of, and a lot of you have alluded this to, you, to this in your questions, and we will talk about this as the kind of the attitude towards diversity and inclusion, and more significantly, kind of belt tightening within organisations and having less budget available. And I think that obviously has implications for us, and it means that we need to slightly diversify our funding sources, which again we'll come on to. Um, yeah, I mean, where you've got companies perhaps feeling like they've ticked the diversity box or the further we move away from, um, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement, how are we tackling what some people call diversity fatigue? Yeah, I, mean, I think that's a good question. And actually, what I I've always had in my mind that we would be, be a kind of sunset organisation. And by that, I mean that when we that we, we can cease to exist when there's no longer a need for us. But I, unfortunately, I think that that day is very far away from mm -hmm. where we are now. Um, what we've seen, and I'm sure that many of you can, this will resonate with many of you, is that the kind of shifting in the way that people prioritise different characteristics. So obviously there was a, you know, when we first started, like back in 2012, we really had to fight incredibly hard to get people to even engage in the conversation. But obviously following the, the murder of George Floyd, there was a massive increase in people talking about racial minoritization. And then with COVID, we moved, shifted a lot onto kind of mental health and resilience. And now there's a real conversation around neurodivergence and disability equity. So I think in terms of that disability, that um, diversity fatigue, the data shows there's still huge amounts to do. We do a lot of our own um, reporting and, and, and surveys, and we know for a fact, as well as multiple other industry um, research shows that there is actually a huge amount still that needs to be done. And actually, again, it always comes back to that bottom line. We know there's a massive amount that it can input, it can support the creative industries. It's like such a booming industry but in order to really thrive you know you will 
you're going to get left behind if you can't do that so that's our message very much you know yeah and we're going to come on to the role of the ceo and what you're looking for in the ceo but i just think on that point you know this is it's a debate that's constantly moving and part of what the good ceo would do is be right at the forefront of the intellectual debate that's going on and the numbers to back up why it's still necessary and um, but we can come on to that in a bit can you just talk about the structure of the creative access team and how the ceo fits into it yeah okay great so um we have we have two core teams we have an access team and a thrive team so our access team is uh, all about as it sounds it's about helping individuals to access the creative industries to access role models set um meant career career opportunities jobs internships mentors and our thrive team is like once people are in post how do we how do they thrive how do they ex um, whether it's reaching a leadership position reaching a, some kind of influence progressing to the best of their ability and helping organizations to create an inclusive workplace to facilitate that so those are our two core teams underpinning both of that is our impact both of those is our impact team and our, we are really proud we've developed an impact framework that basically determines everything that we do so whether you come to an event and you we ask you to scan a qr code and give us your feedback on that or whether we're tracking your progress at pre-internship six months in two years later five years later all of that is really important for us to make sure that we actually delivering the kind of work that making an impact and actually changing the changing the narrative on, on the mission that we're trying to achieve. Um, the other two core functions that um, underpin our work is we've got uh, finance, our finance team and our um, marketing communications team, which serve both access and, and thrive. In terms of the actual, I just want to spend a couple of minutes talking about what we actually do within those teams. So the access team is really about um, we, we have a jobs board where we you can list roles um, and it's just a really good way to kind of widen the funnel of applicants. We have a bespoke recruitment team that we're best known for kind of running internships through positive action, but we actually do bespoke recruitment. We also do mid to senior level recruitment now as well. Um, we do lots of outreach, so lots of events, to lots of um, kind of reaching out to universities, schools, colleges, and all of that sits within our access team. And um, that's headed up by one of our directors, Laura Turner-Blake. Our um, Thrive team, which is headed up by um, a fantastic woman called Yasmin Hemmings, who's actually one of our alumni too. They really focus, as I said, on what's how we enable individuals to thrive. So there's two parts of that. One is the programs for individuals. We have our Springboard program, which is for entry level talent to progress through to about 18 months in their first role. And we have our Thrive program, which is our development program to support people to progress through. And we also have a steering group, which is um, a pathway to board leadership. So those are, and, and, and lots of other kind of programs around freelancing and mentoring and stuff and really supporting people um, to, to get the most out of their really reach their potentials. And the other part of the Thrive program is our the Thrive team is our employer training. So we deliver loads of different training workshops with a raft of fantastic freelance trainers that work with us to deliver everything from kind of diversity and inclusion um, workshops through to, we have a team of three clinical psychologists that work with us around um, building, um, supporting mental health and wellbeing. So, and we try to deliver a lot of the same workshops to both our individuals and to our employers so that it's not a question of fixing somebody, it's a question of changing the environment so that it's it's um, the best possible scenario for everybody to succeed. So, yeah, it's just, it's such an amazing suite of, services that creative access offers and i think sometimes the mistake that people make is that it's just internships but that's kind of where it started and it's evolved so much over the past decade thank you for that lizzie yeah that's a really good point and yeah i totally agree i think that you know for us i think a challenge and it's something that you know we just talked briefly about challenges is actually to communicate the quite the breadth of what we do we're, we're very much about um having a three 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 360 approach to inclusivity so it's like i'm working with our individual employer partners and our employer partners really vary from lots of big household names and you know we've got like warner and apple and penguin random house and the bbc and sky to to, to, for, to, to loads of really small kind of tiny businesses across the length and breadth of the uk and the regions and elsewhere and i think that our regardless of the size you know what we're asking organizations to do is to commit to creating that inclusive workplace and to us to working with them 
And partly what's so exciting about the opportunities for growth is, as you say, it's not just uh, limited to the creative industries because every industry has a creative side. But then even within the creative industries, there are so many that we could tap even more like fashion. And, you know, it's just limitless, really, how much creative access could grow. So there's there's so much more to do, uh, not just because we haven't managed diversity everywhere yet. But um, Josie, so Creative Access was founder-led by you in the beginning. Um, and then obviously in the course of Creative Access's life, it's had a CEO, we're now going to have a new CEO. Um, the last C the current CEO has been really focusing on internal uh, change. How has the structure changed? How has the culture changed since its very beginnings? Um. So I think that like any organization, we're kind of growing from we've gone through that transition from being a kind of startup to being a sort of semi mature organization now. Um, and with and I think that that's been, a you know, one of the things that we've had to change is moving from kind of Excel spreadsheets to now having this incredible CRM system led by our director of impact, Becky, which is really, you know, putting everything onto sales, which we use Salesforce and really kind of digitalizing everything that we do and making sure, and as I said, developing this impact framework. So I think, you know, we've worked really hard to make sure that everything is tracked, that we're evidence led. Um, and really, like, as I said, we've got, you know, our policies in place, we've got really good lines of communication. We're really working hard to kind of democratize the team so that everybody feels that they are able to kind of contribute as much as possible. Um, yeah. And just following up on, so the idea of how the CEO fits into the team, because yeah. um, there's also a COO position. Yeah. So how do those functions separate? Yeah, so that's a good question. So historically, we've not had a COO, but Becky, who is our incredible um, director of impact, is going to be moving into the COO role this summer. Um, and the reason we've developed that role is because what we found historically is that myself as the first CEO and then Bibi, who's our current CEO, have been pulled in too many two different directions. As you can see, we do a lot of different things. And actually, what we want is that real continuity on the work we've developed with our internal culture and supporting all policies and process and systems to continue seamlessly. And Becky is going to be driving that as our new COO. And that will enable our new chief executive to have much more of an external focus and to be able to kind of spend a bit more time you know, really leading, you know, leading the agenda out, you know, speaking at events, speaking at conferences, speak, working with our partners and being much more external focused and enabling our kind of internal systems to, you know, and our culture to develop as it is doing in a really productive way. And do you have a strategy already for the new CEO or do you want them to kind of come up with their own one and execute it themselves? Um, yes, yeah, so we have a process where we work with the whole team. I talked about democratization um, every year um, where we develop a strategy and we get each team lead to, to work on their area and then we develop it as a, a team, the overall strategy. So we're kind of set for 2024. And we have, um, but we would expect to start the process again towards the end of this year, ideally with the new chief executive coming into play. What we're not looking for is when we definitely want somebody who feels strategic, who is innovative, who is entrepreneurial in terms of thinking about new, um, new ways to to um, bring in funds and income and sort of expand our service. With, you you touched on it a little bit before, Lizzie. I think there is a challenge for us in that. There's so much opportunity. So we need what we're not looking, you know, we do we go into different sectors? Do we go deeper into sectors? Do we go into, you know, do we move into technology? Do we look at, you know, there's just so much to do. And I think for us, it's about being quite, you know, not looking to radically change, certainly not in the first instance, our kind of core offering, because we know how brilliant it is, but to build on it. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, in answer to your question, there is a strategy, but there is also um, ample room and you know we would expect a new chief executive coming in to bring their own ideas to kind of think about how we can you know expand and develop our offerings and will there be leadership coaching for whoever gets the job 
So that was a good question. I think, you know, we understand that there will be applicants here who are first time, who will be first time chief executives. And obviously we want to support people who haven't had that opportunity before. So um, if for the right candidate, we are happy to put in place leadership coaching. It's not unprecedented within the organization. And um, it's not, it's definitely something that we would be happy to consider. And you've touched on it already, but um You've said that you want the CEO to be more external facing. What are the main qualities that you're looking for in a CEO and how would you weigh that mix of skills? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. Um, so what we, we talked about um, that there's different responsibilities that we're looking for. And um, so the main responsibilities will be kind of um, new business development and partner relationships. We expect somebody who has experience of doing that, who feels confident and comfortable with going at senior level into organizations and really being out. We, we also would like somebody who alongside that has kind of some kind of commercial and financial expertise so that they feel comfortable with um, understanding how to kind of run an organization. You know, obviously we have a financial director, Emma Shaw, who's been with us since the beginning, who is outstanding, but to work alongside that. Um, there'll also be, we will expect somebody who's had some kind of people leadership, you know, our team is extremely important to us. And um, you asked me a little bit about culture before, but, you know, many of our team are former creative access interns. Most people, are, I mean, I think without exception, everyone on the team has been promoted at some point in the time, in their time. Um, we really want somebody that kind of understands and can work well with our team, um, who are really mm. outstanding. Um, what else do we want? We want somebody who um, critically is not just passionate about diversity and inclusion, but actually is authentic, is credible, can talk about it. So I, what I, I don't necessarily want to hear from lots of people saying I, I'm really passionate about it. I want to know why you're passionate. What have you done about it? What What do you think are the biggest issues that are you know affecting our nation, affecting our our workforce, affecting the creative industries? um what else can I tell you um somebody who's that we are a small team we do a lot we need somebody who's both a thinker and a doer I think that's quite important um ideally somebody that has a little bit of experience around marketing communications um we have again Ella Darlington who is our head of marketing commerce is absolutely brilliant but there's always opportunity for individuals we want somebody who's going to be ambassadorial and who's going to be able to kind of speak um, and feel comfortable it's about speaking to, to the issues and to our work and you know one of the things I would say about creative access is that that sets us aside from other organizations is that we do we have an unbelievable track record of just kind of getting under the radar and just delivering change and really really impacting the way that um, the face of the creative industry is that you know but we haven't necessarily historically been as good at kind of telling people that we've done that. And a lot of other people talk about kind of, they do a lot more ad advocacy than us. And I'm not suggesting that we become an advocacy led organization, although we are increasingly doing things like that with our research. You may have recently read our research on class, which was fantastic. And we've done lots of other reports, but I think it's about being able to just caught with, talk with confidence and, and, and be, you know, really demonstrate how exactly what we've achieved over the years and how we can really affect change within the wider creative industries and within individual organizations. Yeah, I feel like you made a really important point, which is that you have to believe in the mission and you, you've got to, it's got to get you out of bed in the morning. You've really got to, um, you know, live it and be interested in being at the cutting edge of the debate. And, um, you know, when I go to the creative access events, with all the alumni, it's a really amazing communi community to be part of. And, you know, you need to be the leader of that, not just the manager of the organization, you know, and so you got to feel it. It's, um, it's, it's a really special place. Um, Josie, what would the typical week of the CEO look like? Um, okay, cliche answer, there's no real typical week. But what I would say is I would expect that, um, that would it would involve at least one speaking arrangement, whether it's a, a an event, a conference, a um, a talk for a partner, anything like that. Um, it would involve mo probably once a day. I would say meeting um, a partner. We have we we're really proud of our of our client retention. I was just looking at the figures 
yesterday that have just come in through the start of the year and we, we've got like 95 percent might even be 97 percent but certainly 95 percent of our partners are repeat partners which is amazing so once people start working with us they they love doing so and we obviously want to you know we couldn't get much better than that but it means that having those client relationships will be part of a day-to-day -day, um week um we also would expect you to attend creative access events we do multiple different events whether it's an induction for our new intern starters a master class whether it's going out to university roadshows whether it's um running employer training there's lots of different things that we that we do um so and then of course spending time with our team and kind of mentoring and working we've got a really amazing team as i mentioned some of the individual people but also it's like making sure that everybody's singing from the same song sheet that our values are threaded throughout the organization that we're all kind of working at the same pace and you know that everybody is comfortable in in the direction of travel i'm, I'm just going to integrate a question that someone sent in while we've been doing the webinar and everyone feel free to keep sending them in um Josie you're at, you know very impressive figure as the executive chairwoman how do you see the CEO integrating with you working alongside you um complementing you and working together that's a very good question um so we have the benefit now of a little bit of hindsight in that this will be our second chief executive. And I think that this gives us the opportunity to see what has worked and what hasn't worked with myself as the executive chair. Um, I, My intention is to step back from working full time and to move back down to move down to kind of in the region of two days a week, possibly a little bit, you know, around that so that the chief executive and the chief as operating officer and the finance director will really be take, moving ahead and leading the organization. Um, I, where I see my role, which is, I think is important is a, that kind of legacy knowledge with um, some of our big partners um, and really kind of working on some of the kind of bigger partnerships that are, and I mean, I'm going to talk a little bit about the financials, the financials, but really kind of working on sort of effectively new business um, and cutting right back from the day to day organization and handing over as much as possible to um, the new chief executive. OK, and so let's come on to the money. Um, how do we make money? How do we secure funding? How do we keep going? Right. So. Um, we have several different sources of income. Our main source of income is, th is through transactional work. So through the work that we organizations ask us to deliver in terms of recruitment, in terms of running training sessions, in terms of running mentoring programs for them, for example. Um, but so that's a kind of commercial transactional income. We also receive a number of grants and trusts from organizations like the Andrew Lloyd Webber Foundation. We get corporate sponsorship. So for particular initiatives. So for example, the Financial Times sponsor our alumni program. They've given a fantastic commitment for over a three year period, which has just been renewed. Um, Simon's Muirhead Burton, um, Lee and Thompson, both uh, law firms have given us sponsorship money for different items. We get um, some kind of ad hoc donations um, and we get, we have other partnerships where um, the, any income that we get goes directly to our bursary fund. So for example, McLaren um, Racing, they give us, they've given us uh, quite a lot of money over the last couple of years. It's enabled us to give away m money towards, you know, for individuals, for grants for up to a thousand pounds for individuals who are struggling to make ends meet or to progress their creative career. Um, so I would say, so it's about, um, split between our assets and thrive teams it's pretty 50 50 in terms of where the money comes in so it's both you know and it's we also get a lot of income through our jobs board the job board listing that's the transactional income as well um i think my sense is that we're going to need to um be working harder on kind of the grants and trust side coming forward given that that companies within the creative industries have got less we're seeing a kind of downturn and the amount of money they've got to spend on these kind of initiatives so I would say that one of the things that going back to the question about my own role will be to focus a bit more on kind of alternative funding sources because I, my sense is that that is going to be important for us um, going forward um, 
historically a lot of the new businesses sat with myself but increasingly we re, as i said we're, we're going through a real process of democratization and i think that's been really brilliant so many of our team members are now really taking responsibility for managing accounts and for driving new business and it's been really amazing to see and that we would obviously want that to continue because it can't rest on the shoulders of one individual um we'd, we're looking at other ways like for example to monetize our candidate support programs um speaking opportunities that kind of thing as well yeah it's something that we've talked about on the board isn't it about um how you create a culture throughout the organization where everyone feels like it's their responsibility to bring in new business and um you know keep the place going and growing um because they're kind of one and the same and therefore related to that is there a bonus scheme yeah so there is not a bonus scheme but what there is is a profit share so um everybody historically is allocated at the end of the year our financial year has actually just changed it was march to mark uh, Mar- Mar- sorry it was first of april to the end of march it's now become a calendar year but effectively um what we've in its worked out to be about 10 percent of salary historically that is allocated to its profit share so everybody gets the same um it depends really on 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 whether or not we're making you know on our profit share we were in, we're in a healthy state in terms of our finances um we've got lots of reserves that we've managed to build up over the years so we're kind of um you know just to reassure everybody we are in a, we are in a good place there is not a kind of we talked a lot about kind of bonuses and especially on the recruitment side you know the traditional recruitment model is very much around a kind of if you place you get a bonus and we're, we're not we are we're, we're not for profit we're a social enterprise so we're not in the business that we're much more about profit share for the organization um which we've set up okay some general questions about flexibility and then i'll come on to the specific ones because we've had questions come in about that um is it possible for someone to do it as a hybrid position and work a few days a week from home and how many could they do yeah, so at the moment, what we've stipulated is that um, our team do two days a week in the office. We, we're lucky enough that we don't have our own offices, but we are given office space by primarily through ITV, which we've had a long relationship with them since 2015. We were originally in there um, on the South Bank and then we moved with them to Watertown Square and now we're over a White City with them. So we're able to use their desks whenever we want, but there's not enough desks there for us the whole team to you to, to work from and the whole team now is about 20 people 20 25 people plus our freelancers sits at about 30 people um we also have another arrangement with an office in camden um with a FTSE 250 company which is really um a lovely space and we use that as an anchor day on a monday because there's enough room for all of that but we only use that on a monday so what we typically going back to your question is we all meet on a monday in camden and then one other day in the week we expect everybody to be in white city at the itv offices there are obviously events and meetings and stuff so it's kind of up to the individual to organize their own time personally i'm normally in town three days a week and i normally you know but it can shift sometimes it's four sometimes it's two um i would say that it's absolutely a hybrid role um but we do want to encourage people to work together because we all know the benefit of that as well and could the role be compressed into a four-day week yeah, I mean, I, th- I thought about that. There's been a couple of questions about flexibility on both the kind of job share and, and compressing to four day week. And I think that we're open to um, hearing from people as to ways they might want to make it work. Obviously, we are in the business of trying to make things um, as as effective as possible for people. So we, we're not going to rule out any kind of working arrangement. So if you are keen to apply um, with a flexible arrangement, then we'd be more than happy to consider that. Yeah. And so you've kind of answered this question that someone sent in, which is that realistically, if you've got a chronic illness or caring responsibilities, um, given there's so much outside activity, would they be supported in the role? Would they be able to do the role? Um, It's a difficult question to answer without knowing the specifics. Mm -hmm. But what I would say is that, you know, we feel really strongly that any opportunity at any level should be open to any candidate so we are really keen to hear from people and would do our best to make it work we want the right candidate to get this so if their working conditions are less than orthodox that's completely fine we're not we don't have any you know we're more than happy to consider anybody um with any need and we will do our best to support somebody yeah 
might as well apply and then you can have the course. Yeah, I mean, I really would encourage, you know, we want to encourage people who have got lived experience in some of the issues that we are um, seeking to address, whether that's through caring, through their own background. And, if you know, so absolutely, please do feel free to apply and we will, um, you know, we're really keen to get somebody who is the right person for the role and that doesn't necessarily need to be a traditional kind of full-time five-day-a-week role. That's not to say reasonably that we wouldn't expect somebody to attend events because we absolutely would do. We would want somebody to come to events, but it's about, comp- you know, trying to find a flexible arrangement. Um, here's another question from the Q&A, and please do keep sending them in if you've got any questions that we haven't answered yet. Do you have a UK-wide focus for delivery? Listening to the way the business is being described, there's a lot of focus on being in London. Do you think that's accurate? Yeah, good question. So, um Oh, we're based in London, so you're right. And I think I, it's something that I need to kind of check myself on because I do, um, you know, like many people, just refer to the, the capitals a lot. We actually are regional. Um, we have hubs and we, we place people across the length and breadth of the UK. Um, we try to recruit when we do place people not from that local area. So it's not just about catapulting somebody into an area and leaving them there to, to you know, to kind of find their way. Um, we have particular hubs in Bristol, in Manchester, in Leeds, in Glasgow. Um, we, uh, our team members, we've got somebody based in Cardiff, we've got somebody based in Oxford, we've got, you know, somebody based in Brighton. So we are kind of around the UK and we make, we, do, we do try to make it work. Um, but we, I would say that, again, thinking about the, the opportunities, there is a huge opportunity for growth around um, doing more work in the regions. We tend, we try to run what we call regional roadshows where we kind of go out and we present people who are role models to younger people from underrepresented communities, historically underrepresented communities. Um, We recently, we were in Bristol only a few weeks ago. We were in Manchester a few weeks before that. We've been in Leeds. We're all over the place and we're always, so we are out and about, but there's definitely more we could be doing in the regions. Okay. Um, Well, we don't have any more Q&As. But Josie, is there anything else that you wanted to say about creative access that we didn't get round to? Um, well, I'm just going to, what I'm going to do is have a quick look at some of the other questions that have come through, because I feel like, um, if you give me two seconds, there's there's lots and lots of conversa- things that we could still talk about. Um, just give me one second, Lizzie. Um, what I might talk about briefly is some of the other services that we run because I think it might be helpful for people to understand I whizzed through that before but just to talk in a little bit more detail about some of our partners and stuff mm-hmm. and give you perhaps some case studies of some of the work that we've been doing um if that's helpful yeah so um let me give you an example with um ITV so ITV are um as I said, we have an in- a great relationship with them because they've provided us with this virtual space, but they're also a paying partner with us. And we work on them. They, um, there's a fantastic guy called Sonny who is runs the ITV Academy. Um, and we've been working with them for a long time to place trainees. Um, sometimes, um, increasingly, it's been with a regional focus. So we place people on the set of Emmerdale, up in Liverpool and in Manchester, um, and really thinking about, how, and in Leeds, and really trying to do, place trainees there in in roles like costume and tech and really thinking about things that are less traditional um so we've probably had about i would say close to 100 people through the itv placed in in itv over the years um in addition to that we have a really brilliant um we want a mentoring program with them where they've committed that 500 of their staff um, over a three year period are mentoring people from historically underrepresented communities. So what we do is we find the mentees and ITV supply the mentors and then we match them together. We train the mentors, we train the mentees, we deliver training around mental health and wellbeing, around embracing neurodiversity. We um, oversee the partnerships throughout and then we monitor, we track the progress of those mentees over a period of time to see whether it's impacted their um, kind of progress into the sector or through the sector so if they're already working in it and I think it's proven to be a really really effective program both for ITV in terms of their own kind of professional development for individuals within the organization who want to mentor and actually have exposure to people from different backgrounds but also for people to come into the program Um, it's really nice to have programs that have a kind of slightly 
longer focus so they're not just and it's something that we're trying to work on a lot more rather than just a one-off intervention but looking at ways that you can actually deliver longer term so every three-year period for example with ITV um so that's one example I can give you many more if you like well someone's given put in a really good question which is to ask you to expand on what you meant by the culture being democratic right okay so um I would say that because we're a founder-led business, um, uh, obviously I was very embedded in all the decisions and kind of led, and we were very small, like post COVID, we went right down to four people, you know, and now, so, you know, it, so much of the knowledge with, and also because we didn't have all the systems and processes set up that we do now, so much of it was literally retained in my head, mm-hmm. um, which is not a good thing, but I think as people will understand that's by necessity how often startups kind of evolve. So I think what we've tried to do over the last four or five years is work incredibly hard to take the information away from people's heads into our central um, CRM system, Salesforce, and to actually enable all the team to, to be really confident about picking up a conversation where it left off, about progressing it, about developing it, about being involved in conversations around um, our strategy, about really, we we do um, for our, we run a survey twice a year for our team. One is around culture and one is around demographics. So we're really working hard to make sure that we are, what we want to be is the best. We want to be able to demonstrate that if, you know, the best practice around everything around diversity and inclusion, if we can't do it, then how is anybody else supposed to do it? So we really have to work hard and we don't get it right every time, but we would really hope that our um, chief executive will be, carry on this journey that we've, we're working hard to, to, to um, progress. So that is around looking at our culture, making sure that we are um, open to, um, you know, that people feel that it's equitable, that pay rises and promotions, that access to training, making sure that people feel that decision making, that they can trust their leadership, that they've got faith in their line manager, all these kind of things. Um, so what I mean, going back to your question about democratization is really make is trying to also take the decision away from one person and making sure that as an organization, we're much more equitable in the way that we progress everything from the decisions about internally to our partners and, and strategy. Um, and kind of on the subject of reporting lines, there's also a question here about whether, well, who the CEO reports into. Is there a senior leadership team? And then also, um, does the COO start their role before the new CEO? And is there going to be a handover with the current CEO, BB? Lots of good questions. Um, I will try to answer them. So yes, the COO, Becky, will be starting in July, but she's going to be um, already starting to um, pick up parts of our responsibility from our current chief executive um, now so that it's going to be as seamless as possible. She's already done a lot of the work on our culture survey and and other items already. So that will be hopefully as seamless as possible. And our current chief executive is um, leaving at the in the summer, but has very kindly said that she was happy to spend time with somebody coming in to support their induction. Um, we will make sure that we do quite a visceral induction for whoever comes in so that they're able to spend time with each team member um, within each team attending events. Um, in terms of the reporting structures, so we have a senior manager, senior leadership team, We ha- which is um, about seven or eight people. It's the head of our jobs board, Sab. It's the head of Laura, director of the access team. It's, I'm gonna, I know I'm gonna miss somebody off here, so forgive me, if, but it's, it's, it's all the kind of heads of teams and directors and the, the chief executive and myself. So that's the senior leadership team. The chief executive would report directly to myself. On addition to that, we have a board. Now we would expect the chief executive to sit on the board along with myself and um, currently five other members of the board. So that's you, Lizzie Cameron, who is one of our, um, also one of our alumni who's now in a, who is an editor at Penguin Random House, Stephen Page, who is executive chair of Faber, and our, um, Pamela, who is um, legal counsel at Macmillan Publishers and Amit Shah, who is our chair, who is a, has a background in consultancy, who is kind of also the finance man, is really fantastic. So um, I'm not sure I answered that very well, but what I would say is that we meet as a senior management team, senior leadership team once a month. 
I would expect to be in very involved in the induction of the new chief executive and to meet with them as required, but then to pair back my role so that um, they would be you know, able to fly. But obviously we would work with the board. Um, we meet quarterly as a board typically. Yeah. I mean, you talked about the potential for leadership coaching. How do you think um, it's going to be, how, how would a new CEO settle in successfully and what sort of time frame do you see them really run flying with the role yeah it's a good question I, mean, I think you know one of the things that i have learned and again with the benefit of hindsight is that we are actually for a small organization we're relatively complicated and that we do quite a lot but what i would feel really confident about saying is that we have a really exceptional team and i think that the individual heads of each unit are really able to run with it so what that would what that means is that we're going to have we'll be able to have an opportunity for the new person coming in to be able to really kind of understand how we operate and how things work at the moment before they come in and decide you know on their on what might happen because actually what they might want to do next because i think it will be because re- because things are working well is what i'm saying mm-hmm. that i think it gives them the opportunity to do to do that induction have a really thorough induction and then be able to kind of work out the lay of the land rather than have to come in and start doing stuff straight away so we're definitely you know would want to accommodate somebody that they feel comfortable in understanding the range of our services and our partners um as much as possible and the systems and the way that we operate that's not to say that you know it's you know we're not like super complex complex it's just that there's lots of different things as you would expect in 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 the realm of diversity inclusion that we're able to deliver and that we can do deliver sometimes it's about just kind of understanding that yeah so you don't need to reinvent the wheel on day one um there's a question here that someone sent in about just how optimistic you're feeling about diversity in the creative industries obviously you said that you know the work isn't completely done or we wouldn't exist i can't hear you lizzie for some reason i don't know if I'm, hmm. I'm not sure i understand is there something else i can help with is that me going strange potentially sorry it's, it's i think like a human. <laughs> you know, i think i just pressed siri by mistake strange do you mind re- repeating that sorry no Lizzie. there's a question here just about how optimistic you're feeling about the climate in the creative industries and if you were to meet someone who's new to creative access a young person would you say actually you'd be better off starting a career in a different industry um, no, I wouldn't say that at all. I think the creative industry is hugely important to the to the UK economy and it's it's you know, one of our biggest sectors and it's really booming. It's shifting. So the sorts of roles that are um, proving to be more and more popular are not the same roles that were, you know, six, seven, even two, three years ago. So no, I definitely wouldn't say that. But I think that what people... And again, it, it's, it, it depends on the sector. So, But what I would say is that there is loads of opportunity what we need to improve is the regional access to um to, to roles a lot of our, um industries are very heavily focused on london which we've touched on already um but if i you know i have three teenage children and i would definitely can encourage them to to enter the creative industries there's so many there are so many roles that we don't know about there are so many um there is so much opportunity for kind of innovation for um flexible working to be you know not everybody is suited to a nine-to-five job you can work as a freelancer if that suits you you can still get you know we're working hard to make sure that even freelancers particularly those who are from underrepresented communities get access to training um, as much as possible so I feel really optimistic and I think that there is lots of good reason for us to do to I know there's a narrative around kind of negativity but I don't I personally don't feel that I feel really excited about the future it's interesting where you say about, you know, the regional issue and there's stuff to get your teeth into. One of the questions is what the three most pressing issues are facing the new CEO. What's the top of the intro? Um, right. Top of the intro. Um, I think as with anything, you know, our bottom line is what keeps us going. We need to pay for our staff. We need to pay for our delivery. So I think it's about, um, you know, really trying to, I mean, one of the things that's always been a challenge for us, actually, which I would really like a new CEO to have a fresh perspective on is the concept of employer partnership. And by that, I mean, what does it mean to be a partner with us? Is it a transactional issue through one intervention because you are listing some roles on our job board or is it a whole mentoring program like the one that I referred to with ITV and to think about whether or not we should consider some sort of subscription model or whether or not we should be thinking about some kind of kite mark or just something that would 
um, you know, really help us to kind of focus our minds a bit more about what that means, because actually there are, we have hundreds of partners. I mean, literally we can work with kind of five, six, 700 partners across a year. Um, obviously only a few of, only a handful of those are our kind of top partners with whom we work really closely. So I would say top of the list is really to think about um, you know, what are the most pressing issues? How do we, how are we best placed to deliver those? And how, is it through kind of spreading wide or going neat, you know, deep and narrow and focused? Um, well, we've answered every question that's on the list and the Q&A that's been sent in. So this is everybody's last chance to send in one more question. But Josie, is there anything else you'd add before we go? Um, I don't think so. I think um, I'm just having a look at my notes. I mean, I think that you know, this is a really exciting opportunity. We are, we recognize that a lot, we've had an interest in people from different backgrounds and um, that, you know, people will bring different things to the table. So it's quite hard for us to kind of be really specific about, you know, because that obviously we will manage the team according to the skills of the person coming in. Thank you. Um, as well so I, I would just say I'm very very excited about this I think it's a great opportunity for somebody who wants to get their teeth into a really really first rate organization that has a phenomenal track record exemplary partners and a wonderful community I mean it makes my heart sing to see the people you know our alumni coming through including to your, yourself so I think that for it really is an exciting opportunity so if you are curious if you are commercial if you are um kind of credible and authentic when it comes to diversity and inclusion then please please do consider applying because we really would love to hear from you just before i let you rerun through the process and the start date the interviews and everything who who will be doing the interviewing there's a very serious question here josie which is and i didn't even know it was a physical thing where do you keep the oba <laughs> i haven't got it yet <laughs> i haven't got it yet but um apparently i'm going on the 9th of july to windsor castle so i'm very excited about that and i'm able to take four people with me which is great well if you need a date <laughs> <laughs> um so yes i don't know what it would look like but apparently it's like a medal or something in a box nice. uh, thank you um so should we run through the the uh the serious bits of the start yeah. date with him yeah um so I hope, sincerely hope we've covered all your questions. I recognise we've raced through lots of things and we may not have got through everything exactly as you wanted, but if you get through, if I, the, the very first process will be a conversation with myself. So the application deadline is on the Wednesday the 17th at 12 p.m. If you don't have the application form, the full um, application pack, please email me, josie at creativeaccess.org.uk and I will send it to you. Um, and you apply through our website and it's just a two page letter that we're asking you to um, send along with your CV and answer a few different questions. Um, I think we've put them on the pack, like four different things to cover so that we can understand where your motivations are and your experience. Um, don't worry if you don't meet every single item on the kind of desired essential list. That's it's just a guide. Um, so please you know, feel free to just tell us a bit about yourself and why you think that you'd be interested in the role and why you think you'd be good at the role. Um, so that's going to happen next week, the deadline for applications. Then um, we are, will be going through, we will be going through the applications and we will do calls with people to clarify things on the application forms. To, you know, that, so the kind of first round that's going to take place on the uh, next Friday, the 19th and Monday, the 22nd and Tuesday, 23rd. Appreciate it's very short notice, um, but there will only be kind of half an hour calls. Um, and then the interviews for the people um, that are going to be doing the first round, we will probably ask you to do a short presentation. We will not give you a lot of time to prepare for it. So we're not expecting a huge amount, but just a few pointers for you to think about. Um, and the interviews will take place in our office in Camden on Monday, the 29th of April and Friday, the 3rd of May. And that will be with myself and our chair, Amit Shah and Cameron Myers, who is one of our board members. And um, they will be approximately an hour long interviews. We will put all of this in writing. So um, don't worry too much, but just to, in terms of diary availability, um, we are trying to move quickly. We recognize that, um, you know, with our current chief executive leaving in the summer, we would like, if possible, to fill the role in for a start date in September. If that doesn't work, it's not the end of the world. We will be flexible for the right person. But in an ideal world, that's why we're moving 
fairly swiftly. Um, and then we'll do a final interview around the week of the 13th of May. And what we would like then is to make sure that the final candidate or candidates will also get an opportunity to meet members of our team um, and get a chance to speak to them and to, to sort of vice versa, to kind of have a conversation and, and, and ask any further questions. And as I said, hopefully we'll be in a position to somebody to start um, in the autumn. Awesome. Um, well, thank you for all the info. Someone actually wrote a question and then retracted it, but it wasn't really a question. They were just saying thanks for all the candor. Um, and I appreciate it as well. It's been really interesting to just hear about the nuts and bolts of creative access. So thank you everyone for coming and listening and good luck and hope to meet you at the interviews. Thank you all very much for joining. And I hope that um, it's been a useful session. We're really grateful to you all for your interest. Um, and yeah, look forward to hearing from you all. All right, bye. Thanks, Josie.